Good afternoon, and welcome to Nursing Grand Rounds. Uh, for those colleagues in the audience who may not be familiar with us here at Mass General and Nursing Grand Rounds, it is a monthly session devoted to expanding the knowledge of nursing through uh, discussion with other colleagues um, and we're pleased this month in particular that our newest colleagues uh, from the University of Massachusetts have agreed to present to us um, some of the work that they do through our dedicated education unit. Um, a special thanks of course goes out to the leadership of White 7 and Ellison 7 for their support of this innovative and fascinating um, program called the DEU and of course to um, the faculty and the administration of UMass Boston and a special thank you um, to everybody's favorite gal, Dr. Gordia Bannister. So, um, welcome also to my colleagues out there in the, the electronic world. We are being broadcast to our satellite campuses across the MGH family and greetings to my colleagues who will be watching this in the future. Um, because all Nursing Grand Rounds are also recorded for a repository on our website so that everybody has the opportunity to um, participate with our new colleagues. Um, at this time, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce a um, very special person. Uh, Martin Lanteri is a staff nurse on Ellison 7. And Martin has been with Ellison 7 for about 14 years. I believe that's where he started his career as a PCA and now um, participates both as a staff nurse uh, where he frequently uh, precepts and mentors new staff, uh, but most especially in what we have come to respect him so highly for it's his passion for students, his passion for education, um, and serves in this very non-traditional role of a mentor and teacher and clinical instructor in this very innovative program. So it gives me great pleasure um, to uh, welcome to the podium um, a friend and a colleague, uh, Martin Lanteri. Thank you very much, Gino. Um, as Gino mentioned, I have been at Mass General for about 14 years now, and I also worked as a, um, a traditional clinical instructor, um, and more recently in the DEU. And what I'm finding, what a lot of people are finding with the DEU, is we're getting a little closer to uh, bridging the gap between education and practice. Um, in the DEU, as some of you may already know, the way it works is you've got uh, a nurse, and two, sometimes one student, and the nurse is actually caring for those patients while she's instructing the students. So what we find here is that the students are finding that they have more responsibility for those patients. They're understanding the responsibility of an actual nurse, and they're also uh, participating more in the outcomes, uh, seeing the whole story with that patient. Um, and then the, one other thing is, uh, if anybody saw Patricia Benny here about a month ago, she talked about socialization of students, and that's sometimes one of the hardest things for students. Um, in the DEU, that socialization is much easier because their instructor already works on the floor, and conversely, the, it's easier for the unit to socialize the students because the unit is a dedicated education unit. Everybody is dedicated, several instructors working together, even as staff nurses. Um, so at the end of every semester, the DEU likes to try to give back uh, to the unit. And this year, uh, with the help of, um, or sorry, with the instruction of the course coordinator, Katie Kafel, and the nurse manager, Teresa Capitolupo, and the uh, CNSs on Ellison 7 and White 7, the students are going to talk to you about uh, three hotbed issues in nursing, which are <clears throat> um, change theory, uh, safety rounds, and uh, communication. So without further ado, we're going to go uh, group by group here, starting with Lisa Caravaggio's group. She's another clinical faculty coordinator who also works at Brigham Women's and has been with DEU since its inception. Um, so let's take a look at the first group and see where 
uh, education actually can influence practice. together on this presentation, but due to ease of time and flow of presentation, I've asked two students to present together as the group. So I'm going to introduce Joanne, who is going to introduce the group to you. Good afternoon. My name is Joanne DePalmer. Um, we're all from Ellison and White 7 on the DEU. Um, we're here today to present Change Theory, and we're very happy to be here. Um, this is Yana, Amy, Abiola, Alessandra. Harry and Nana, we all work together for this project, so thank you. All right. Hello, I'm Yana, and I will be presenting the three uh, stage, the, the three theories. So the first theory is put forth by Levin. Step, step, step one is unfreezing. Unfreezing is necessary to overcome resistance. This can be achieved by preparing participants for change, building trust and recognition for the need to change, and actively participate in recognizing problems and brainstorming solutions within a group. Step two is movement. This is the hardest step as people are unsure or even fearful. Ways to achieve the movement step is to persuade employees in a situation is not beneficial to them and encourage them to view the problem from a fresh perspective. Work together on a quest for new relevant information and connect views of group to well-respected, powerful leaders and also support the change. Step three is refreezing. This stage involves establishing stability once the changes have been accepted. Way to achieve this step is to institutionalize new patterns through formal and informal mechanisms, including policies and procedures. Our next theory is put forth by Lippitt. Lippitt created a seven-step theory that focuses more on the role and responsibility of the change agent than on the evolution of the change itself. Step one is diagnose the problem. In this step, the nurse, leader, staff nurse, or healthcare professional notices and diagnoses a problem. The need for change is then made known to other members of the staff who will be affected so that meetings can be held to decide on how to move forward. Step two is assess motivation. Find out if those that will be affected by the change are willing to let it happen or are opposed to it. Come up with solutions that will address all possible problems and may be encouraged to the road to change. Step three is confirm the change agent that confirm that the change agent can do the job. Determine if the change agent has what it takes to do the job by way of stamina, experience, and acceptance by nurses and other staff, as genuine desire to see the change project succeed, and the right personality. Step four is write a plan to implement the change. The plan should contain detailed steps that include timetables and deadlines. Responsibilities are then assigned to all who are involved in making the change happen. Step five is determine the role of change agent. Preventing any confusion as to what his job is, thus preventing misunderstandings or resentments. Step six is maintain the change. All parties involved in the change project communicate with each other and the change agent to update themselves on the progress of their individual tasks. The final step of Lippitt's change theory is gradually terminate from the helping relationship. Finally, change is made permanent by creating rules and policies that have to be followed. And last uh, change theory was put forth by Havelock. Stage, stage one of his theory is establish a relationship. This could be generated as a stage of pre-contemplation where things are going along as usual. Step two is diagnosis. Here a need for change is evaluated. Step three is acquire resources for change. The need for change is understood in the process of developing solutions begins by gathering as much information as possible. Stage three is selecting a pathway. A pathway of change is selected from available options and then implemented. Stage four is establish and accept change. 
Individuals and organizations are often resistant to change, so careful attention must be given to make sure that the change becomes part of a new routine behavior. Final stage is maintenance and separation. Once the change has become the new normal, the change agent can separate from the newly changed person or organization. Now we're going to take a look at some recent changes at Mass General Hospital. Changes in policies, procedures, and practice are constant throughout the hospital and the entire healthcare field. One recent change that has occurred and what has worked in the transition will be examined. We are going to look at the Electronic Medication Administration Process for Patient Safety, or commonly known as EMAPS. EMAPS involves the transition from paper-based medication record to an electronic medication record. It was officially rolled out hospital-wide by November 2009 after a gradual rollout unit by unit. At first, there is much resistance to this change, as is common with any type of change in policy or procedure. So, how is this rollout successful? The various barriers were addressed. 24-7 technological help was provided to all staff members using EMAPS. Um, I'm sorry. EMAPS coaches on each unit were available to answer any questions or to instruct staff nurses or anybody else that was using it um, in its use. Multiple seminar classes were provided, which included practice with the system before the rollout. Staff feedback was also taken into consideration. Finally, the gradual unit-by-unit -unit rollout also helped to facilitate the transition to EMAPS. We can learn a lot from these recent changes. By identifying positive factors in implementing changes and learning from things that were not so successful, it can help us in the future. Adequate staff training with the opportunity to ask questions, hands-on practice with the new system, gradual rollout of a new policy or procedure, and staff input and involvement in the change are all factors that were integral to the successful adoption of EMAPS, of the EMAP system, which has decreased medication errors, increased patient safety, and increased RN satisfaction. By addressing these issues, we can implement successful and patient-centered changes that benefit everyone. Looking beyond the healthcare field, let's take a look at a case study from Brockton High School. Low test scores left school officials and parents asking, what are we going to do about this problem? The school system created a curriculum that could help address this problem. This corresponds with the unfreezing step. The new curriculum at Brockton High School added reading, math, and writing components to all classes, including gym. Teachers were trained to help facilitate this new way of integrating learning into all aspects of school. This corresponds with the movement or adoption of change phase of the different change theories. With continuous reinforcement of the integration of learning and updated curriculums, more faculty began adopting the changes and implementing them, corresponding to the refreezing phase of the change theories. The result, better test scores and overall success. The bottom line is that whether it's in a school such as Brockton High or a healthcare facility such as Mass General, change is very hard. Using theory to guide practice, any of the three theories, can help facilitate a more smooth transition and yield the best possible patient outcomes. And now here's some Q&A with Christine Grady McKee, the CNS on Allison 7. She was asked, what is an area of change that has been made on Allison 7 in the past? The answer is PCA smart pumps were introduced to patients pain management. PCA pumps proved to be a very successful tool. Then she was asked if this change was always successful. The PCA smart pump is a great addition to the unit. It provides patients with control of their pain, but also allows patients to feel in control of their body. It is a great plus since usually patients feel like they lose control while they're hospitalized. Finally, uh, she was asked about some upcoming changes, which is e-chatting, and it's a new change that's coming up. CNS Christine Grady McKee does not foresee any barriers to e-charting, and she expects that this new change will improve documentation rounding. Thanks. Please hold all of your questions until the conclusion of all of the presentations. Thank you.
so the, so the second group is actually my group. I'm the clinical faculty coordinator for this group, a little bit larger group, but we've just got three speakers here. Um, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, we're calling it hourly rounding here, but of course we, we prefer to refer to that more as safety rounding, uh, same concept. Um, and here's my group to talk to you about. Okay, so my name is Brittany Goes, and we are all part of the DE group on either Ellison 7 or White 7. We decided to do our presentation on hourly rounding, also known as safety rounding at MGH, to look at the positive as well as the negative outcomes. So we're going to start with what is hourly rounding? Hourly rounding is a systematic bedside rounding done purposely and intentionally to look at, at specific times. Therefore, each hour the nurse checks on his or her patient and also lets them know that they'll be back in an hour. They like to address the seven P's, which is person, plan, priorities, pain, position, personal hygiene, and presence. So the first P is person. Here the nurse introduces him or herself to their patient and again lets them know they'll be back in an hour to check on them. The second P is plan. Here the nurse explains to the patient their goals that they have for the day. The third P is priorities. It is also important to know the patient's priorities and what they would like to accomplish for the day. The next P is personal hygiene. Here the nurse should make sure that the patient is using the bathroom and if they need any assistance with doing so. The next P is pain. Here it is important to assess the patient's pain level and offer medication or treatment to reduce the pain. The last P is presence. Oh, position, sorry. To make sure that the patient is comfortable and to reposition the patient, reducing the risk of pressure ulcers. Also, presence is the last P, which is just being there for the patient. Hi, my name is Jocelyn Lavoisier, and this is a cue card that White 11 uses for hourly rounds or safety rounds. Um, on the left side are the steps which incorporate the seven P's that Brittany just addressed, starting with informing the patient that you are there to do hourly rounds and ending with, um, before you leave the patient's room, make sure that there is nothing else you can do for the patient by asking them. And before you leave, make sure that they know that there will be someone there within an hour or two to check on, on them. Documentation is very important with hourly rounds in that it plays a key role in validation. Documentation can be like this checklist that MGH uses. It can be posted in the patient's whiteboard in the room, at the nurse's station, or in the medical record. Hourly rounding works because it makes the patient feel like they're not alone. It helps the patient know what to expect for the day. It prevents potential problems like patient falls. And it, it also reduces the, um, the distance a nurse has to walk in a day as well as nurse's time. The Sturta group analyzed 27 different units and 14 different hospitals nationwide, and they wanted to see how hourly rounding affected call lights, patient falls, and patient satisfaction. They found that the top reasons for call lights were bathroom assistance, the IV pump alarm, pain medication, and position change, all of which are issues addressed in the seven Ps. The positive outcomes of hourly rounding with the CERTA group found that when specific actions are incorporated into hourly rounding, like the scripting, it decreases the patient falls, decreases the call light, decreases skin, skin breakdown, and also increases patient satisfaction. One year after the study, the CERTA group found that over 80% of the units continued using hourly rounds, and, and over 90% of the hospitals expanded hourly rounds to other floors. Some of the challenges included with safety rounds is that the formal scripting, scripting seems too rehearsed. However, it is, it is so rehearsed because it's intended to standardize practice. Another issue is that nurses already have a lot to document. However, documentation can help nurses learn more about the patient, like finding patterns in the patient's pain. Keith Perlberg, the MGH Director of Quality and Safety Assistance, safety looked at evidence-based practice to see how floors round at MGH. He, he found that 
Rounding was done from every hour from 6A to 10P and every two hours from 10P to 6A, alternating a PCA and a registered nurse. Keeping in mind that collaboration and delegation is important with the PCA and the nurse. A, f a floor that started hourly rounds in particularly after there was an increased number of falls found that after hourly rounding, there was a decrease in falls. Hi, my name is Leah Levesque. And so currently on White 7, the, hourly, the early phases of um, introducing hourly rounds has started, and the staff is conducting their own research to discover the positive results of hourly rounding. So, so far, their research has found that the top three call light requests are bathroom trips, accidental calls, and ambulations. However, in order to increase and promote positive results, patients do need to know that they will see a staff member in the following hour. Otherwise, they'll act as if the hourly rounding or the safety rounding doesn't exist, and it will have no effect on the positive results that evidence has found. So on the next few slides, um, they face some of the quotes that we received from the nurses when we, when we asked them about hourly rounds and how they felt and thought about it. Some nurses do experience positive feedback, which makes which increases patient satisfaction, and others have found that it does decrease patient anxiety, and this is especially helpful if patient doesn't have many visitors throughout the day or if they aren't as clinically needy. Some nurses do feel that they already do their own version of hourly rounding and they don't need a script or documentation to validate it, and they do find that the documentation is an added task through their day and the scripting is a little too formal and too repetitive, especially if you're working a 12-hour shift. So Ellison 7 is also planning on implementing their own hourly rounds by, found, by starting to follow the hourly round and typical guidelines. They're also involved in the nurses and PCAs to alternate visits throughout the day. And it is, it is important to acknowledge that hourly rounding will have to be customized each day to each patient and know how this would apply to your patient and benefits and barriers and remembering that each patient is different and therefore hourly rounding that day will also be different. So in conclusion, the positive evidence revealed by several recent studies has sparked interest in nursing hourly rounds, not just at Mass General, but in hospitals around the world. And although hourly rounding is still in its very early phases of being researched and implemented, and there are many different approaches and attitudes towards it, the common goals for everyone include an increase in patient safety and satisfaction, as well as benefiting the nurse by optimizing their time and activities. So thank you, and again, we ask just to hold your questions for the end. If you noticed, there was one common theme with both um, hourly rounding and um, the first presentation on change theory, and that common theme was communication. So I'd like to introduce my group now, who will talk about communication and delegation practices between various role groups in acute care settings. Thank you for your attention. PCA to room 22A for bathroom assistance, please. PCA to room 22A. I'm going to check my green book to see if there are any special tasks I need to complete with this patient. I don't see any. Wah, wah. I'm going to count that into my patient's room. Are you all done in the bathroom? Yep, I just moved my bowels. Let me help you back to bed. Okay, I'll be back later. I'm going to empty the hat into the toilet. Cal sat out. Oh, well, Kim, hey, how did that guaiac come out? I didn't know I had to do a guaiac. <sighs> Effective teamwork is not a given, but a goal that requires training and cultivation. A quote from the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality. As we researched current methods of interdisciplinary communication methods in healthcare, it became obvious that communication roadblocks are present in many areas. As we all know, there are countless teams involved in the care of each patient, making efficient communication and patient safety a challenge in all areas. 
We found many different tools being tested or used in multiple areas of care, and we realized that our research project could be expanded exponentially. However, we knew that we had limited time and resources, so we chose to focus on communication with PCAs on inpatient medical surgical units. As student nurses in the dedicated education unit, we have been blessed with a very high level of clinical experience, practitioners who enjoy sharing their values and expertise and love of nursing with their students, and a hospital that truly values the next generation of nurses. In our time here, we occasionally act as PCAs in the sense that we're happy to help whenever a spare set of hands is needed. When doing this, we see a small slice of work load that each PCA takes on and how an improved communication tool could greater affect efficiency, have less questions to busy staff nurses, and provide a greater level of patient care and safety. It also takes into account the variety of knowledge level among PCAs, ranging from traditional PCAs to student nurse PCAs. The aim of this project was to gather information related to communication methods between registered nurses and patient care associates and to understand its impact on patient care and safety. Supporting literature names certain factors that interfere with the collaborative relationship of RNs and PCAs, such as workload, staff shortages, and time constraints. Our objective was to create a tool that would facilitate communication between RNs and PCAs without adding to anyone's workload. We used two tools to conduct our research, one survey for PCAs and one for RNs. We utilized a convenient sample of the two populations at Mass General and collected responses over one week in November 2010. The surveys included personal background data, like Kurt scales, and free form comments. 95% of respondents were RNs and the other 5% were PCAs. Participants averaged 10 years of employment in their positions with a median of seven years and a range of less than one year to to 30 years. Cumulatively, respondents had 171 years of experience among them. So in our findings, we found that 90% of RN respondents stated that they regularly give report, whereas only 67% of PCAs stated that they regularly receive report. 100% of all respondents feel that they communicate effectively with their counterparts. 100% of respondents feel communication is always important. And 100% of respondents also reported that they are not receiving sufficient information to increase quality of care. So despite the numbers of 100% saying that they effectively communicate with their counterparts, 100% also feel that they could receive more information to provide safe care for their patients. 75% of our RN respondents reported that they communicate abnormal findings to their PCAs, whereas only 25% say that they report only findings that are pertinent to the PCA's task. 100% of PCAs say that they feel comfortable communicating abnormal findings to their RNs. So although the statistics display that communication is a high priority and statements that communication is, uh, I'm sorry, that communication barriers are reflected upon in our, okay. So although the, the statistics say it, that communication is a high priority and statements that communication is effective, feedback from both our RNs and our PCAs say that there is a breakdown in communication that potentially hinders patient care and safety. So this communication barrier was reflected in our survey in the free comment section, where both RNs and PCAs agreed that there are significant roadblocks, especially in the reporting of abnormal findings such as vital signs, blood glucose levels, and changes in mental status. So these comments here describe the common themes that we found within our survey. There probably needs to be a better system for reporting between RNs and PCAs from an RN. I like getting report. It helps me give better care to my patient from a PCA. It, communication, is necessary to provide proper care and address issues as they arise from a student nurse PCA. And student nurses always receive report and are more likely to report abnormal findings, however PCAs in the traditional sense, don't seem to want to have any more additional information from an RN. Okay, as you can see, communication is an integral part of the medical field, especially in regards to the facilitation of proper patient care and safety. 
Extensive evidence-based research has proved that the lack of communication has a detrimental impact on patient care. Through the collaborative efforts of research supporting literature, the perspective of nurses and PCAs, and observation at clinical sites, we devised a tool that we felt could possibly enhance communication benefiting caregivers, but more importantly, the patients. We wanted to create a tool that would not add to anyone's workload, but that would actually create a more efficient work environment for everyone involved. The tool we devised is a checklist outlining the delegation of tasks to a PCA by a registered nurse. Please take a moment to refer to the handout provided in the UMB folders you were handed. Um, in our practice attempts, the tool took less than two minutes to complete at the start of the staff nurse shift and less than one minute for the PCA to review before entering a patient's room. It is in our opinion that this tool will serve to be useful, simple, and facilitate increased patient safety and improve health care outcomes. PCA to room 22A for bathroom assistance, please. PCA to room 22A. Look at this cool new PCA task management tool. It looks oh. like I have to guayac all my patients' stools. You're going to count that in. Are you all done in the bathroom? Yep, I just moved my bowels. <laughs> I'll be back later. Thank you. Let me guayac my patient's stool. Pass that out. Oh, okay, Kim, how'd that guayac come out? It came back positive. Great, I'll tell the team. Our hope is that this tool could perhaps be piloted, piloted to assess its worthiness in the near future. I'd like to close with one final quote from Dr. Paul Skive, Senior Vice President of the Joint Commission. Our challenge is not whether we will deliver care in teams, but rather how well we will deliver care in teams. In your folder, there is an evaluation form to provide feedback of our PCA task management tool. Please take a moment to provide us with your comments. It's greatly appreciated. At this point, we'd like to open up the floor for questions about all three presentations. Thank you for your time. Caracuzzi, and I'm also one of the class representatives for our entire cohort. Um, I think that it was a really interesting process for everyone involved, not only to be able to participate in the dedicated education unit, which is such... Back me up here, guys. <laughs> all of those adjectives. Um, we all felt that we were a valued part of the team on the floors where we worked, where we had our clinical process, and that's a new feeling for most of us. We didn't feel like we were students and that we were in the way. We felt as if we were part of the team and we were helpful. And that was a great feeling because it really boosted a lot of the self-confidence of all of our students. So in order to do this research project, we kind of had to step out of the student role and step into a researcher role, which our research class last semester came in really handy. And we really were able to utilize that and we worked as a team. And the three different groups really supported each other and the staff nurses and the faculty at the hospital and also at the school supported us. And we just can't thank you guys enough. 
Did I answer your question? I've got a comment as well. <laughs> Next. Um, I'm Shauna Miller, also a um, class representative of our cohort, and I, she kind of stole my thunder, but I just wanted to thank the staff for being so receptive of the fact that we are stepping out of this role into something new and doing research, and they were all very willing to participate in our surveys and give us feedback and comments, and, you know, good or bad, they let us know what roadblocks that we would come across, you know, trying to produce these new tools and it kind of helped us to create something that would be realistic and something that very well could be piloted in the Mass General Hospital and across the, the practice. So thank you. Anybody else? Don't be shy. I'm Dr. Winfrey. Um, I want to know what is going to be your next step? And is this something that the next CEU group of students is going to continue with? Or have you got that far? Of course, we thought of grad school and everything else. <laughs> 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 and Dr. Banks, they say I'm about to show that. I think that I can respond to that. Yes, um, yes. I'm Kate Williams, <laughs> Kate Course Coordinator. And since the three groups did such a, I think, a tremendous job today, in the last group in particular that developed a tool, I would hope that it would be piloted, at least on the DEU units in the spring semester. Of course, these students will be in another rotation at that time with only fond memories of the DEU, but there'll be another group because we've tried to build on from group to group to group so that they do realize the importance of their contribution. So yes, I'm hoping, of course, with Teresa Capitolupo to perhaps pilot it uh, in the spring semester with the new DEU group and then sample uh, the success and our failure of such a tool and if, in fact, it is needed here at Mass General. Thank you. This Barbara Blakeney. Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Congrats, Mr. Program. My question to all of you is, now that we've done research, what is your thought on the future? Me again? <laughs> Somebody else. Come on. How does it feel to be research? Okay. <laughs> um, Raise your hand if you liked it. <laughs> I think it gave us a whole new view of exactly what research in nursing is. It was great to have a class on it. It was great to read papers and understand the fundamentals of it. It's entirely different to put it into practice and actually be responsible for producing a project. Um, we're all very happy to say that we'll be using this on our resumes. <laughs> um, and I think that Research in nursing is an extremely valuable field that isn't staffed enough in the upcoming generation, and I hope that this group and others will take it upon themselves to look into it a little bit more, because it's a really important area of nursing. Amy? I'd like to just add one more thing, um, and that every single time that we go to clinicals, whether or not, you know, we're handing out a survey, or whether or not we're officially conducting research, I feel like any time that we're interacting with patients, with nurses, we're gathering so much information that can help us and can help nursing in general um, in the future. And I feel like, you know, just being able to communicate with doctors and being able to communicate with nurses and physical therapists, I think that whether or not it's, you know, traditional research in the sense of, you know, doing surveys and analyzing statistics, I feel like it's, it's always research and any time that you can look at a situation, see an outcome, you can then use that to develop your own practice and develop your own, you know, methods of doing things. So I think that thank you for doing the um, for doing the research on that and providing with your providing your it was a group effort. It was. Well thank you. So. Anybody else? Yes. Um, I'm Jack so first I want to say wow, um, incredible, incredible presentation. I think what we've done in the research is really contributed to nursing knowledge development. So you can give that to us, a really great gift. Um, I also want to really acknowledge that, um, recognize the critical role that the DAs play in that team, and they are so important to So contributing to their job satisfaction is really uh, a lot of things. Um, just curious, were there other topics that you considered um, yeah, in terms of the research, or would the just jump out to the 
Um, actually, we came up with the safety rounds as a build-up on last semester. Last semester, Mountain Land Terry presented hourly rounding, and he was asked, actually, to represent, to re-remind, because it's going to be initiated on the DU units. Change theory we thought was appropriate because there's so many changes ongoing right now. And then the communication um, kind of wove its way through, and... Um, in collaboration with the CNSs as well as the nurse manager, as well as the students' observations. I asked them early on in the semester to just observe, observe where they thought there were any potential deficits, where there was potential room for improvement or implementation from our perspective. And they looked at communication as an area that we could cover. So I think that we attempted to cover it um, as well as possible from our perspective, but really it was student-driven because they're there right at the front lines observing. We had another question in the back. Hello, I'm Gordy Abandon, Executive Director of Patient Care. Um, amazing job, all of you. One of the things I was interested in was your comments related to the DCU, how excited you were to be a member of the DCU, how positive you um, are reflected on it. What we want to know, though, is it would be better for you to think about it. Um, I think, again, if I can reiterate how lucky we all are um, to have the opportunity to be in the um, dedicated education unit, it's just so amazing the things that we've seen, the things that, you know, we've been able to do for our patients. Um, but, I mean, perhaps, and of course, it's a staffing issue um, or, you know, having people available, but I do almost feel bad. Um, because, you know, there are some of our classmates that didn't get to experience um, the DEU, um, you know, and they've had amazing experiences in the traditional um, clinical rotations, um, but, I mean, perhaps just expanding it, um, you know, to allow more students to experience all of the amazing things that we've been able to experience, I think, would be, you know, my personal suggestion. I don't know if anybody else echoes that, so... Well, to respond to that, and I, I've realized that as course coordinator, the DU initiative started in the junior level med surge course, and my hope as well as um, the hope of the administration of UMass Boston is that upon graduation, every student will have experienced a DU um, type of rotation somewhere along the curriculum. So with that being added, uh, we're currently working with Children's Hospital in forming a DEU and Good Samaritan Medical Center in forming a DEU. So it is growing. Um, it has been successful. So I think the students uh, need not feel too bad for their counterparts because they are having positive um, experiences in the traditional, but the DU is likely to be in their future as well. Anyone else? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Joanne De Palma. I just wanted to say that if you think about the three groups' pro, um, presentations today, it was change theory, um, safety roundings, and the PCA. I think that the PCA communication, I think that when you look at it, it's all about the patient as well, and that's why we're here today, because we want to improve the lives of others, and we should just always remember that every day we come to work. So. That was very well said by Joanne. Thank you so much. Um, so if there's no more questions or comments, or is there? Oh, Teresa Capitalupo, nurse manager of both DEU units, who we will applaud. Thank you, Teresa, and we'd like to thank the administration at Mass General, 
um, as well as the PCAs at Mass General, who I will not neglect to thank because they started orienting on week one. Uh, they had a hefty job ahead of them. They oriented very um, enthusiastically our students to the role of the PCA. So I think that's where the teamwork and collaboration was initiated at first. As well as I'd like to thank the administration at UMass Boston for making this a wonderful experience for our students and we hope that this will continue. Um, on that note, I would like to reintroduce uh, Gino Cesari, who is going to conclude our program as well as talk about future nursing grand rounds here. Thank you very much for your attendance and attention. So, say that to me. Um, it's not every day that I'm surrounded by such young, talented, bright people. So, uh, please thank you, stay, and um, enjoy this moment. Um, as I was sitting there thinking about um, what was being said and the power that each of you brought, I uh, immediately started thinking about my day tomorrow. And my day tomorrow is going to be spent at a statewide summit on the nurse of the future. And one of the things that I'm supposed to do in the afternoon is to facilitate a group of uh, academic people and practice people about how do we integrate and how do we begin to move uh, a new paradigm forward in which um, education and practice truly are bridged and so that the competencies one learn in school are truly the competencies that one needs in practice um, as you so beautifully said because it's all about the patient. So you can be sure I'm going to be bragging about you guys tomorrow, uh, about how wonderful this is. And um, it takes a village. Many of us who work here at Mass General um, have heard our chief nurse, Jeanette Ives Erickson, say that many times. It takes a village, and it certainly does take a village. And I'm inspired and I'm encouraged that the future of nursing is quite bright. It's healthy. It's alive, and um, as somebody who was also a student at Mass General and has spent almost half of his life here, um, I, I welcome you, and I hope to see you as colleagues. Um, I'd like to have um, certain people join us. They deserve a huge um, applause and gratitude. Of course, we have one already. Marty, would you join us? Um, Joanne, would you join us? Uh, Lisa, would you join us? I see you hiding back there, Corey. Come, Brady, come up. Corey, are you here? Is Corey here? Corey's not. And of course, Tracy, you need to join us. He's come right up here. So, um, this is what the future of nursing looks like. This is the integration of the academic, the practice world. This is the fusion of the young, the old, and um, I'm thrilled. So to all of you, on behalf of Mass General, um, particularly Gordia and Jeanette, um, thank you for being here, and thank you for the outstanding work that you do. Um, one last little plug, or two plugs. Uh, join us, please, on December 16th at 1.30 for the December Nursing Grand Rounds. The topic is going to be on septic shock and the continuum of care um, and the experience of the patient in septic shock um, in the transition of general care to critical care and uh, back again. And also, I understand that uh, no celebration is complete without cake. And so in the hallway is cake, so please join us. Thank you all very much. Uh -huh.